Okay, welcome to the webinar on how to synchronize iLink and EEG and MRI devices using Experiment Builder. Um, so I thought we could just start off by, um, I'm going to move ahead here. I thought we could start off by talking about a, a very brief introduction to kind of the hardware that's involved in the EEG and MRI um, settings and then give like a overview of how these synchronization methods work. So kind of like what's the general idea behind these uh, synchronization methods. Um, then I think it's important for us to have at least like a brief discussion on parallel ports and how they can be used to send and receive synchronization signals as parallel ports are kind of the main um, interface for synchronizing with devices like EEG. In MRI environments, sometimes people use parallel ports, but often the MRI kind of converts its sync signal to a keyboard uh, emulator. So it its sync signal comes to the computer kind of as a as a key press or it's detected as a key press. So it might this discussion of parallel ports might not be relevant for MRI, but it's critical for, for other synchronization. And then finally and kind of most importantly, we'll discuss how to implement these sync signals in Experiment Builder. So um, let's jump right into it. Um, in terms of the system hardware, I just wanted to kind of briefly give you a couple slides about this. Um, for synchronization with EEG devices, typically people use um, the desktop mount of the iLink 1000 or 1000 Plus. And um, some EEG researchers use the, the system in the chin rest mode or head stabilized mode, and some researchers uh, use it in the head free remote mode. Um, if you use it in the head free remote mode, then you need to place a target sticker on the head. And in EEG, this isn't an issue. You can just place the sticker directly on the EEG cap. Um, you can see. Uh, in the picture on the left, he's not actually wearing an EEG cap, but if he were, he could be wearing the sticker on, on that cap. Um, so in EEG settings, you're typically using the desktop mount. In MRI environments, you have to use the long range mount um, because you know the MRI environment contains a super strong magnet and you cannot bring anything containing ferromagnetic metal into that environment. And so you have to use a special version of the of the iLink camera and uh, illuminator that are safe to go into those environments. So it's you have to use this long range setup. Um, and there are different lenses and, and there are dis different distances involved. Some people use this with EEG, but it's not really necessary as we've never really like seen any issues with the desktop mount. Um, but anyways, so this is what you're going to use in the in the MRI environment. Um, in terms of synchroniz system synchronization, I thought we would first talk about like the general idea behind synchronizing with EEG and then talk about the general idea behind synchronizing with MRI because the ideas are a little bit different in these two environments. So first, if you are synchronizing with EEG, the display PC or in other words, the computer that is presenting the experimental stimuli, the one that's running Experiment Builder, or the one that's running your Experiment Builder project, it's the one that is kind of driving the experimental session, or in other words, it's controlling the timing of all the experimental events. So um, this is a little bit different than MRI. So basically, in an EEG setup, the EEG system is going to be just recording continuously. and you so you start the EEG recording and then you start your experiment builder project and experiment builder will kind of control the pacing of the trials and everything and the idea is that you just send synchronization pulses um, to the host PC which is recording the eye movement data file and to the uh, EEG device so the general idea in the EEG is you on any given trial the display PC is going to draw to the screen, like present the trial stimuli, and as soon as it does, it sends a message that can that is used for synchronization purposes to the host PC and a sync pulse, which is kind of the same type of idea as the message, 
but it's over a parallel port or something similar, it sends a sync pulse to the EEG device. So on any time an experimental event happens, so if you're presenting an image, if you're playing a sound, if you're waiting for a, a button press or a keyboard press, basically anytime anything of importance happens, you want to send markers to the eye tracking data file and to the EEG device basically simultaneously. Um, and these, if you you know, if you're using Experiment Builder and you're using the message property of a display screen action, and you put the TTL pulse right after the display screen action, then these pulses are basically locked to the timing of the screen retrace. Okay, um, the get back to here. The pulse, like. The, the message that's sent to the host PC, as you probably know, is sent over the Ethernet cable that connects the display PC to the host PC. The pulse that is sent to the EEG device is most typically sent from the parallel port of the display PC. Um, and if your display PC doesn't have a parallel port, you have two options. One is you can use a special device that basically converts a USB signal to a to a TTL style pulse and Experiment Builder um, supports a device that's called a um, USB 1208 HS and if you don't have a parallel port in your display PC and you want to have the display PC send the pulses you can use one of those devices and that can be used on Mac or Windows. Um, another alternative if your display PC doesn't have a parallel port is that you can send the pulse from the parallel port of the host PC, um, and I'll, I can kind of show you how to do that um, in a second. So basically, when you send this pulse, um, it can be done over the parallel port or of the display PC or the host PC, or it can be done via the uh, USB device on the display PC. Um, when you send these pulses, they actually can have different values. So we're going to talk about kind of how the pulses work in a second, but um, basically the idea is you're, you're kind of just sending a marker, and the marker is going to, in all the EG environments I've seen at least, the marker is kind of just received as a numerical kind of uh, value. And um, in most setups, you can have 32 of these different values. In some setups, you can have 256. But basically the 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 values can range from 0 to 31 or 0 to 255 depending on on how you are kind of sending your pulses and how what kind of cables you're using um, and so you can use the idea is you can use different values to code either different trial events and or uh, different conditions of trials so like if you have, for to code different trial events, what I mean is like if you show three different pictures in a given trial, you could send a different pulse value for each of the different pictures, and by different condition information, I mean that on different trials you could potentially send different pulse values so that in the EEG data you can um, kind of if you see a certain pulse value, you know that corresponds to a certain type of trial, um, and you know you can optionally do drift correct or drift checking between trials if you want to uh, that's kind of typical it's, um, another option in the EEG so so I kind of think about this TT to go back here I kind of think about this TTL synchronization um, option as being mandatory so like you should always be doing something like this basically this will give you markers in both the EEG and the eye tracking data file of when the critical events happen and you can later use these markers to sync up your data in data analysis. So I think about this method here as being something that every EEG researcher should probably do. An optional um, different way to, to synchronize in an EEG environment is to use an analog card on the host PC. So this is an optional piece of hardware that you would have to get from us um, and it's it's a PCI card that goes into a desktop host PC and it basically sends it has BNC connectors that kind of come out of the the card and um, the card converts the eye tracking data that's being recorded on the host PC um, in a digital format it converts that digital data to an to analog signals in real time and 
these are these analog signals are output to BNC connectors, and the voltage range of these analog signals is configurable on the host PC. Um, and there are going to be three of these BNC connectors for each I that's being tracked. Uh, one of the one of these BNC channels will send horizontal position of the I. One will send vertical position of the I, and the third will send pupil size. Um, the analog card also, just so you know, can allow extra digital in and out um, channels, which is kind of like the same idea behind TTL sync pulses. So it can send and receive sync pulses too. Um, not very many people use it for that purpose, so I don't want to focus on that today. Um, but the main purpose of the analog card, just to clarify, is to send kind of like the data in an analog format in real time during the experiment. And I think of this analog card, and, and sorry, I should mention, these BNC connectors would be connected to empty EEG channels. So like in an EEG setup, you're going to have like maybe 128 electrodes on the, on the cap or 256 electrodes on the cap, um, or whatever, however many electrodes you have. And then in the EEG recording uh, device and software, you can have empty EEG channels. So these are, these are channels that don't correspond to electrodes on the cap, but that can basically receive these analog signals and record them alongside the EEG channel data. Um, so basically you would have like an analog kind of signal that would um, move kind of up and down as the eyes move left, right, up, down, or, or as the pupil size changes um, as time goes by. And I think of this analog card option as quick and dirty. Okay, so I, I say it's quick because it's your data is kind of already all aligned. You you have all the EEG data and all the I data in one spot um, because the I data is just going to be represented as different channels in the in the EEG data file. Um, so it's quicker and you don't, aren't kind of dealing with two different data sets and worrying about the alignment and data analysis. But it's also dirty, and it's dirty for two reasons. First, um, you're adding, well actually three reasons, it looks like I'm miss, missing one here. Um, you're adding noise to the data by doing the digital to analog conversion um, on the analog card, and then again on the EEG device, it's going to convert that analog signal back to a kind of a digital record and you you add a little bit of noise by doing that conversion you also the second reason is you that's not listed here is you add some noise by just sending a voltage along a wire like anytime you send voltage along a, a wire it's susceptible to kind of um, noise interference from the room um, this is usually not that big of a deal but it's a, it's a consideration and then the third factor is like um, you're the third reason I say that it's dirty is that saccade and fixation information is lost. So in the digital data file of the host PC, in other words, the EDF file, you have markers of when saccades and fixations start and end. But when you use the analog card to send the, the iData to the EEG device, um, it's just kind of like a position trace. Of the, the horizontal and vertical channels are just showing position traces, and there are no markers in those... Uh, traces of when saccades and fixations kind of officially start and end. So if you wanted that information, it would be up to you to find some way on the EEG data file to kind of mark that information. Um, so that's why I, I say the first method of sending the sync pulses that I'm in, I'm going back to this slide. That's why I say this is kind of mandatory and then this analog card uh, method is optional. Um, okay, just so I wanted to show like a little diagram of what happens in a in an EEG experiment. So basically, the display PC, you're going to be running your experiment builder project, and at some point, um, you're going to present your kind of trial information, right? And the idea is that when you do present your trial stimulus, the display PC is going to send a message to the host PC, and then basically simultaneously send a TTL pulse to the EEG device. So I have these three computers represented here. You have the display PC up here that's um, presenting the stimuli, and when it does, it sends a message to the ho to the host PC, and it sends a TTL sync pulse to the EEG. And just just so you know, like critically, this is going to happen like well within one millisecond. So you have basically simultaneous markers in the two data sets. Um, and then optionally, if you want, you can have the host PC be streaming 
the analog data to the EEG device in real time. So this is kind of the typical type of setup and this, this TTL pulse can be sent over the parallel port of the display PC or through a USB 1208 HS device that's um, plugged into the, to the display PC. Um, if you don't use the display like let's say your display PC doesn't have a parallel port and you don't want to get a 1208 HS device then you can instead use the host PC's parallel port. So in this diagram I'm just trying to show like um, how you could do the same synchronization without a parallel port on the host on the display PC. So you could instead use the host PC's parallel port. And so the idea is like when you draw the, the trial stimuli you can send a message to the host PC and in addition send a command to the host PC to have it send the TTL pulse to the EEG device. Um, so you know if you don't have a dis uh, parallel port in your display PC don't fret because you can use, use the host PC's parallel port to do that. And again you can always additionally kind of optionally send the analog data to the EEG device as well. Okay, so that's the general idea behind EEG and eye tracker synchronization. Um, and we're going to come back and talk about how that's implemented in an experiment builder project later. Um, but just to shift gears a little bit, now let's talk about how MRI synchronization is done. So in, in MRI synchronization, the idea is a little different, okay? So it's not really the display PC in an MRI sync um, setting. It's not sending sync markers to the MRI device. Instead, the MRI device is kind of controlling the timing of the experiment. And, and if you think about the way that MRI experiments work, this makes sense. Like in an MRI experiment, you're going to at some point start a scan, uh, like scan cycle or scan run or whatever you want to call it, scan block. So you're going to tell your MRI to start scanning and the MRI is going to send a TTL pulse to the display PC that's going to tell the display PC when to do certain things. Okay, um, And you can imagine this is important because you, you only want to be kind of presenting the um, experimental events like at a time when the, when the MRI device is actually kind of doing its scanning, right? So in, a, in an EEG environment, the EEG is just recording continuously, so all you have to do is just send markers to it. But in an MRI environment, like it's doing its scanning of the, of the brain and kind of going through slices of the brain, and you want to make sure that trial events happen at certain times during that scan process. So in an MRI environment, it's, it's kind of the other way around. The MRI is controlling the timing of things, and the display PC is waiting for the MRI to tell it when to do certain things. Okay, so in an MRI environment, the MRI is sending the sync pulse um, to the display PC, and the display PC is kind of in turn sending a message to the host PC. And this same sync pulse that's going to like lead to a message being sent to the host PC is also typically going to trigger like the the trials display um, screen onset or like the trials stimulus presentation. And when the when the experiment builder project presents that trials image, it's going to also send another message to the host PC to just mark the exact time of the image onset. And in the MRI environment, this pulse is going to be sent from the MRI to the parallel port of the display PC. Or in a lot of cases, the MRI device kind of sends its signal to some special kind of hardware box that will turn that signal into a key press. So in a lot of MRI environments, um, the, the signal coming into the display PC actually just seems like a key press. And in some ways that actually makes things a little bit easier because you just have you don't have to worry about like any of the parallel port stuff that we're about to talk about. It just comes in as like a certain letter being pressed on the keyboard. Um, so in those cases, the idea is exactly the same in terms, in terms of how the synchronization is done. The difference is just that you're waiting for a key press rather than waiting for a parallel port signal. Um, and then in an MRI environment, you typically, if you're going to do a drift correct or drift check type procedure, then you're going to do that between blocks. Um, if you're familiar with how the iLink systems work, then you know that there's this, and you can kind of 
check into the manual if you're not familiar about this. There's sections in our manual in the 1,000 and 1,000 plus user manuals that describe what a drift check is. But anyway, it's like the drift check procedure requires either the experimenter or the participant to press a key when they're fixating a target to initiate the beginning of a trial or block. And um, we, since this kind of requires somebody to press a button or a key, uh, it adds some kind of extra timing and you, the timing isn't predictable and so usually you don't do that in the middle of a scan cycle because it might disrupt some timing that you're trying to control. Um, so typically in an MRI environment you're going to do that between blocks or between scan cycles. Um, and there's also some options about doing online drift correction with mouse click in, um, in an MRI environment. Sometimes in, in an MRI, envi MRI environment, you have participants that kind of shift position or, or um, kind of like basically move into some position that's going to disrupt the accuracy of the eye tracker. And so instead of doing a drift correction between every trial, you can do drift correction online with a mouse click. And again, there are like sections of the manual that describe how to do this. Um, but let's move on. Um, so the, the, you can see the idea is different in an MRI environment. The display PC is waiting for the MRI to tell it when to do things. Um, so the in terms of the timeline, it kind of looks like this. Um, the MRI, which I have over here, is going to send a sync pulse to the display PC. Display PC is going to send a pulse, to, I mean, or send a message to the host PC when it receives this, just to say like TTL received or sync pulse received or whatever you want to say to mark the occurrence of that in the data file. And you know, depending on when the display PC monitor has last re refreshed, there might be a, a small delay here. You know, this is going to be typically less than one, the, the interval of one retrace. So like at 60 hertz, this would be like 16.67 milliseconds at max. Um, like delay between the time you receive the pulse and the time when you draw the screen. So I, this looks a little bit exaggerated in terms of the timeline, but this is going to be very brief here. Um, so basically it's receiving the pulse, using that pulse to drive the presentation of the stimulus, which happens almost instantly. And then um, the display PC is sending markers to the data file when both of these things occur and these will allow you to kind of like sync up the data later in analysis. Okay, so if you have any questions about the general ideas of these, um, let me know. I, it's important that this stuff is clear. Uh, um, but those are the general ideas behind EEG and MRI synchronization. So I thought um, it would probably be worth our time to at least just kind of briefly talk about parallel ports, like what they are and like, you know, how to use them to do the synchronization. So um, I have a little kind of diagram of a parallel port. Like if you've never, if you don't know what I'm talking about when I say parallel port, you can, um, you could Google it or whatever, but basically parallel ports were used in the past to um, most commonly used in the past to communicate with printers. Uh, but it turns out that they have like excellent timing properties. And so a lot of researchers and a lot of like research equipment um, use it, a lot of research equipment use, uh, uses parallel ports to do synchronization because of these timing properties. Um, and so even though they're kind of like old interfaces, since they have such great timing properties and since most types of research equipment support synchronization from parallel port signals, um, they're commonly used to synchronize different devices. Um, and in an EEG setup, sometimes the cables that come out of the parallel port on the display PC, sometimes they route to a parallel port on the EEG device, like on the EEG amp or on some kind of EEG communication interface box. Um, and sometimes the EEG devices require a special cable that has a parallel port on the display PC end and it has some other special interface on the EEG device in. So sometimes it might be a nine pin connector on the EEG end and sometimes it's some other type of uh, connector. But um, I've 
of all the EGs I've ever seen, you can you can they can receive synchronization pulses that originate from a parallel port. Um, parallel ports have 25 pins on them, as you can see in this diagram. And let's move on here. In terms of these pins, they are divided into what we call three registers. And there, there's a lot of information about this on the internet um, and in other places. So if you want to kind of learn a lot more about this, you can do more research. But I wanted to give you the kind of the important details. Um, so there are, there are three registers or sets of pins on the parallel port. Um, the data register, which is kind of illustrated here, D0 to D7. The status register, which is shown here. And then a control register. Okay. On the parallel port, the signals are always going to be sent to these other devices using the data register. So using pins 2 through 9, which are uh, the data we call them data bits, 0 through 7. And on the receiving end, of the, if you're using a parallel port to receive the signal, then the signals can be received either on the data register or more commonly on the status register. And if the receiving computer, if it's being received on a computer, um, Sometimes you can switch between receiving um, on the status register or data register by turning one of the control bits on or off. Um, but for kind of simplicity's sake today, we're going to assume that the signals are going to be sent to the EEG device on the, the status register. Okay, um, and that's the default configuration. But again, like. Sometimes the EG will have its own kind of special type of interface and there's not really a data status or control register, but the idea is the same whether you're using a parallel port interface or some other kind of interface on the EEG end. You're basically just sending pulses over some pins on these connectors. Um, so by pins, I mean like literally the, like the little metal pins that stick out on the, I should have said that at the beginning, the little metal pins that stick out of the connector. Um, okay, so let's let's just talk about kind of like the data register and its pins. So let's talk about these eight pins here, two through nine here. The way these pulses work is that each pin is like a, a binary bit, right? And so each pin or bit can be on or off. So each pin is kind of like a light switch, right? It can go on or off, one or zero. And since you have eight pins or bits on the register, when you send a pulse to a device, it's like you are sending eight on or off commands simultaneously, okay? And so you can see that you can represent the signal you're sending via an eight-digit binary value. And in this eight-digit binary value, each of these digits represents a different pin. Okay, so each pin, is, as you can see here, is, is either on with a one or off with a zero. And if you think about it, or kind of like sit down and work it out, like this means two, uh, 256 different values are possible. So 2 to the 8th power is 256, and so that's how many different possibilities there are, how many different 8-digit binary numbers there are. And so basically when you send the pulse, you can send values between 0 and 255. So what you do when you send a TTL signal is you basically say, okay, right now set these pins to this on-off configuration, okay? And based on the value that you send, so you do that by sending a, a value between 0 and 255. And based on the particular value you send, it will like turn certain pins on and certain pins off. Okay? So when you, like, when you go to send the TTL pulses, you're going to think about it in terms of sending a value between 0 and 255. But what you're effectively doing by sending that value is telling which of these pins to be turned on and which of these t pins to be turned off. Okay, so it's kind of like you're you're controlling like eight different lights. You can imagine using your eight eight fingers and like 
simultaneously flipping eight different light switches in a certain way, okay, like kind of instantly. All right, so that's what you're doing when you're sending these pulses to an EEG device, okay? And um, on the receiving end of things, let's imagine if your EEG device is receiving on a parallel port, it's typically going to be receiving on the status register. And the status register only has five pins. Um, and so I'm just going to jump ahead. Um, most, the most common, so there are really two different types of parallel port cables. The most common type of parallel port cable connects five of these data register bits to the status register. So since the status register only has five pins, basically only five of these data register bits are being sent to that status register. And so in that case, the, the receiving computer really is only receiving five on-off commands at the same time. And so really the receiving computer can only kind of resolve 32 different values, like two to the fifth power is, is 32. So, so that means you are receiving a five digit binary value. And so you kind of, don't worry about the details of this too much. I'm just trying to say like sometimes on the receiving end, you might only be using five of those pins. Um, let me go back. Um, on the receiving computer, if it's coming in on a parallel port, you can configure it to, to actually receive the pulses on this on this uh, data register too, um, and that will require kind of like a different type of cable. But if you're receiving on the data register, you can receive on eight different pins, so you can receive you can receive and resolve all 256 values. Um, and so, like whether you're receiving on the status register or whether you're receiving on the data register, um, like that's kind of gonna control which type of cable you need to be getting. So there are two, two main types of parallel port cables. The most common ca cable kind of routes five, as I mentioned, routes five of these data register uh, bits to the five status register bits. Um, but another type of cable, which is like a straight through cable, it sends like all the bits on one end to the exact same bits on the other end. And so in that case, the data register, you're sending over the data register on one end and on the other end, you're receiving, and on the EEG end, you're receiving on the data register too. Okay. Um, so you have to like do some investigation. If you're using an EEG device, do some investigation, figure out like what type of connector um, does the EEG device require for receiving these pulses? And if it's a parallel port connector, is it expecting the pulses to come in on the data register or on the status register? And that'll determine whether you're going to get one of these kind of like crossover cables or whether you're going to get one of these straight through cables. Um, but anyways, that's kind of like the basics of parallel port interface. I wanted to kind of hit the important things. Um, if in most cases that I've ever seen at least, like if the EEG device has already been set up um, before you get the eye tracker, then when you get the eye tracker, like all this stuff is already kind of configured and you just have to like make sure to send the pulses in your experiment. And again, you're, just, you're always going to be sending over the data register. So usually there's not really much to do in terms of configuring unless you're like getting all this equipment at the same time and then you have to make these decisions. But the, what I'm trying to say is like the interface with the EEG is going to be done in the same, in an eye tracking experiment, it's going to be done in the same way that you would typically interface with the, with the EEG if you were doing an EEG only experiment. So if you were doing an experiment that only involved EEG and no eye tracking, then the way that you interface with the EEG is exactly the same as the way that you would interface with the EEG if you're adding eye tracking to it. Okay, so I just wanted to kind of give you a background on this stuff in case you're interested in it. That's, that's parallel ports. Um, so now let's kind of, and if you got any questions about it, you know, let me know. But now let's jump into how you can implement uh, the synchronization using Experiment Builder. So I hope I didn't make everything sound too complicated there because it's actually like once you go to do it in Experiment Builder, it's actually quite easy. Um, so I'm going to, I have a couple different Experiment Builder examples that I've programmed 
and I'm going to post them to this to the same site of this that had the webinar announcement um, to the same thread that had the webinar announcement um, after we're done with this, so that you can you can download it and and check it out um, and use it for your own purposes if you like. But basically, in this EEG synchronization example that we're about to talk about, there are 12 trials. On each trial, a different pulse is being sent to the EEG device upon onset of this trial stimulus. And as I mentioned, like you can use these pulse values to tell or to give your, yourself information about the type of trial that it was in data analysis. And I'm doing like a very simple way where just each trial has a different pulse. Um, but you could do it where a certain pulse value represents a certain condition or a certain pulse value represents a certain trial event in the case of a trial type where you have like lots of different events in the trial. And critically, a clearing pulse is going to be sent at the beginning of the experiment to make sure that we've kind of reset the, the, um, the receiving kind of device to a kind of neutral state before the next pulse is sent. And it's, it's critical to send this type of clearing pulse because, like I mentioned, when you're sending a pulse, you're basically flipping on, flipping switches, like on, like flipping eight light switches at the same time, right? And you can imagine, like just imagine you're in a room and a light switch is on and then you go in, if you try to turn it on again, it doesn't change the light condition, right? And it's the same thing with a parallel port, uh, port type pulse. Like if you just keep sending the same value over and over again, then the, the receiving EEG actually isn't going to detect anything because there's no change. So that so the EEG basically just detects changes in the in the status of these eight uh, signals. And um, if none of them are changing, then it doesn't detect anything. So it's it's critical to kind of like clear them all back to like an off state before you send the next pulses. Okay, so let's uh, I'm going to kick out of this. PowerPoint and open up the example that I had that I have and this is going to be posted as an EBZ file um, on the in the forum thread that has a webinar so um, if you want an introduction to the basic like if you don't understand experiment builder at all I would say stop right now and then go back to the forums and go to this video tutorials section and um, watch this video series that introduces the basics of experiment builder programming. So, you know, if you're not familiar with experiment builder, stop now, watch this, and then come back. And once you come back, the rest of this will make sense. So, um, basically, the way that we send these sync signals to the EEG device is through a special action that we can see here that's called set TTL action. So, you know, you can click and drag, and now I have a set TTL action. And um, let me add that back. If we look at this action, it has some properties over here that we can see. So the first is its label, and the second is its message. So we always want to fill out the message. So if I were using this, I would make sure to, like, put in, I'm just copying and pasting the label and putting it in the message field. But this message is going to tell the host PC when this action is executed. And you can see, you can... Um, specify which type of device it's being sent through and if you're sending it through the parallel port um, kind of before you set up the rest of your project it's probably a good idea to go to the devices section of the structure panel here and go to the parallel this is where you can set all the hardware settings of your experiment and go to the parallel port section and you can um, specify the base address of your parallel port. And so don't get intimidated by this, these weird numbers here. It's really not that complicated. So basically on, on any computer, like you have all these different hardware devices that are part of your computer. So maybe like Ethernet ports and parallel ports and serial ports or whatever they are. So the parallel port has kind of like a physical address that the computer um, uses to say like okay like this is the kind of hardware address of, of this device and if the parallel port is built into like the motherboard of your computer which is 
less and less common these days, but if it is built into the motherboard, that almost always has a, a base address of 0x378. So the, the 0x, this, if you're not familiar with, with this type of stuff, this just means hexadecimal, and so this number here is a hexadecimal value, and by hexadecimal I mean like 0 to uh, so it means that there are 16 different values in in the numbering scheme. So in binary, there are two different values, zero and one. In our normal normal kind of number scheme of decimal, there are 10 different values, zero through nine. And in hexadecimal, there are 16 different values, um, zero through nine, and then a b c d a b c d e and f. So, yeah, that's right. Um, so so this is just the address is specified in, in hexadecimal values. And if you don't know your parallel port base address, Experiment Builder actually has this nice feature where you can just set this to zero and it'll do it when you run the project, it'll do an auto detection of the parallel port base address. Um, and so if you're not sure, then the easiest thing is usually just to set this to zero. Okay. If, you want, if you're curious about it and want to know what your base address is, you can go to Control Panel and then in Windows and, and like go to like Mac. You're not going to be dealing with the parallel port. But on Windows, you can go to System, then bring up Device Manager, and then you can see the parallel port's going to be listed under COM and LPT. And it, if you select the uh, parallel port, then you can go to the resources and you can see there's the this first number here is going to be the base address of the parallel port and since I'm using one that's like built into the motherboard it has this uh, 378 um, but if you're not sure again you can just put a zero there but if you wanted to put the exact value you could check it like I did and then type that value in but anyways alright so you to go back to the TTL action you're going to add the TTL action and then you can see that it's going to be sent over the data register and there are two ways that you can specify the value or the kind of configuration of those eight bits. Um, you can specify them in a word manner or in a pen manner. If you go to pen, then you're going to see that you, you can see the status of each of those eight bits on that data register and you can just change each one to on or off. And this kind of allows, in some ways, a more intuitive way to think about these different things, um, but kind of it, it might make things a little bit more complicated in terms of like setting things up. So I, I typically tend to think it's easier to do things in the word manner, and in the word manner, you basically you can type in the if you want to send the same value um, every time, you can just type in a value. So if I type in 255, that's the same as turning all of the pins on. So that's the same as, in, in binary terms, that's the same as this. Let me show you. Um, let's bring up a notepad or something. Okay. That's the same as, no, okay. That's the same as typing in something like this, 11111111. So that's turning all the pins on. Um, and if I type that into the, into this property here and hit enter, you can see it actually does the conversion automatically to hexadecimal. So for whatever reason, like when people are talking about parallel ports, they also they'll often talk about that that binary value, which is eight ones and zeros. They talk about it in hexadecimal terms. And zero XFF is a hex it's a two digit hexadecimal value that is FF. And FF is the same as binary one 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 and it's the same as decimal 255. So if you convert between those numbering schemes, then FF is the same as turning all these things on. And so that's one way you can, that's, that's basically how you use this set TTO action. That's how you control the pulse value that's being sent is through the, the data property here. Um, and so you can see what I'm doing here at the very beginning, let me delete this. What you can see is at the very beginning of the experiment, I have a TTL action here that's just resetting um, that all the pins on on the or all the bits on the data register to off by get sending a value of zero 
and you can see when I type in the zero, it converts it to hexadecimal zero, which is the same as decimal zero. Okay, so we're turning all the pins off here, and then this is a lot, the rest of this structure is a lot like the rest of our exam, or most of our examples where you basically just present some calibration instructions and then go into camera setup mode and then start the trial events, so start the trial sequence. And this example is really, really simple. So if we look at the data source for our trial sequence, um, it, we have a trial number here. Uh, we have some text. So I just have like a column that's called word. That's the word that's, so on this, if we run this experiment on each trial, you would see a different word being presented. And that word is like one of these words here, which is the same as the trial number. And in this case, I probably actually didn't even need a separate column for this because it's redundant information. Um, but I have a column that's telling, that's storing the the pulse value that's going to be used on each trial. And so, I, as I mentioned, we're going to send a different pulse value on each trial, and here's where the pulse value is going to be stored. Okay, so if we go back here, this is the thing that's looping and using those different uh, these different values on each trial. And if we go inside the trial sequence, you can see we have a normal prepare sequence and then drift check. This is kind of the same of any, or, or most of our experiment builder examples. And then we start the trial events, which are going to be stored in the recording sequence. And here's where we're going to display the trial stimulus. And, and I'm just using a simple text resource here. This actually comes from the, the simple example. I just modified the simple example to make, to make this. Um, but anyways, this text resource, you can see from its text property is referencing the tech, the word column of the data source. And so it's presenting that different word, one, two, three, four, whatever, on each trial. And then immediately after the display of this stimulus, we're sending the pulse to the EEG. So critically, you want to make sure to put this set TTL action directly after the display screen action. Don't put this before the display screen action. So a like kind of rookie mistake in sending EEG signals and sending signals to an EEG is to put the TTL action before the display screen action. But if you do that, then the experimental flow could hit will hit the TTL action first. And then depending on when the monitor last updated, um, we'll need to might need to like wait some amount of time like up to one retrace before the monitor can be drawn and so in that case you could have a delay between the TTL pulse and the actual time when the when the command is sent to the monitor to update the screen of up to one retrace and like you know timing is of critical importance in EEG experiments and so we want to make sure that these things are kind of synchronized um, as best we can, and so to do that, it is critical to put the set TTL action after the display screen action. Oops, after the display screen action. If you do that, if you put the TTL after the display screen action, then the timing of this pulse will be within one millisecond of the screen retrace. So Experiment Builder does like um, retrace locked kind of um, experimental flow, and so that means basically when the experimental flow hits this display screen action, nothing will, like, the, it won't proceed into the next action or trigger until this retrace occurs. And so if you put it afterwards, then the signal will be sent to the EG within a millisecond of the monitor's retrace command. Um, so it's critical to put it after that. And basically, if we look at the display trial stimulus action, we have a message here. So this message in the in the eye tracking data file in the EDF file is going to tell us the time when the stimulus was drawn in the eye tracking data, and then this um, pulse that's being sent to the EEG device is going to mark the occurrence of the trial stimulus in the EEG device, and you can see th this TTL action is pretty simple. The only thing I've done here is instead of using a hard-coded value here, like if I go back to putting zero there, that's a hard-coded value. Instead of doing that, we can click this button 
find our data source column that's called TTL value and double click on it and that'll make it use the value that's specified here on each trial and so on trial one on the on the trial with the one with the word one it's going to send a value of one over the parallel port on the trial with the word two it's going to send a value of two etc so this way we're changing the pulse value that's sent on each trial and you can imagine you could code like the, a condition code here and then that way when when the stimulus onsets it'll send a condition code that will both mark the stimulus onset and give you um, stimulus condition information in the data file or if you went into like if you had several of these display screens in one um, trial or lots of maybe play sound actions or any other kind of events that you're trying to mark in the EEG data file, then you could send a different one of these TTO actions and have it send a different value. And you could, you could use a different value either by hard coding that different value in here. So if I wanted to send a value of five, I could do like that. Or you could have a reference to a different data source column for each of your trial events if you wanted if you wanted those values to change from trial to trial okay so this is going to mark the stimulus event in the EEG file and just to be extra safe that we have a synchronized marker I'm also sending a message to the eye tracking data file and then in this example we're waiting for 10 seconds or for a key to be pressed and then we blank the screen and so this is just a blank display screen action. And when we blank the screen, we send a clearing pulse that has a value of zero, which is going to basically turn all the, the pins off, which is going to be the same as sending this. Okay, so we're going to turn, turn them all back off so that on subsequent trials, we will be able to for sure detect a non-zero pulse value. Okay, um, so it's actually like it's actually pretty simple once you go to implement it you just need to make sure to put the TTL action after the um, the event that you're trying to mark and you need to make sure to clear it at the end of the trial and another kind of mistake some people make is they want to send like just a, a very brief pulse to their EEG device and so um, sometimes people do something let me just change the structure a little bit um, let me save this save this as something else so I don't mess up my I'll just call this test and I'm saving it like this because I don't, I don't want people to actually uh, make the same mistake but I'm like sometimes people will do something like this they want it to be a pulse of a brief duration and so they'll do like a one millisecond pulse and then they'll turn it off I'll, I'll just call this set TTL off okay and like that's fine experiment builder can send the one millisecond pulse but the problem is that like and then they turn it off here the problem is that and then maybe they'll have another another they'll wait for a key press or something like that and so in this case you can imagine like they're just sitting and you they might not have something like this so in this case they're just sending a pulse but the problem is that the duration is only one millisecond and so a lot of devices cannot if they detect such a brief pulse they can't detect it and so to be safe in terms of the receiving device we would always recommend if you, if you want to do things like this send a pulse of at least 20 milliseconds in duration to be to be sure that your receiving device can can detect the pulse but I mean to me it's the simplest thing to do I'm gonna go back to the to the one that I was working on earlier to me the simplest thing to do is like like have one marker for when it onsets and a different marker for which it for when it offsets and then you have like a clear marker of both these events in the in the data file so to me that's this is how I would set it up but you can do just a short pulse if you do it the way I just showed you but if you do it that way make sure that the that the duration is um, longer than than like a millisecond or two you know something like that do 20 milliseconds Okay, any questions about the EEG synchronization? Okay, well, let's jump back to our little PowerPoint here. And I'm going to go from the current slide. So let's move on to the MRI synchronization example. Um, so in this MRI synchronization example, I also did 12 trials, but this time I divided it into three blocks. 
of trials, and each block is meant to illustrate like a scan or run or, or scan cycle or whatever different MRI labs that I've visited refer to this, this type of thing in different ways. But basically, I'm talking about a period of time where the MRI is actively scanning the brain. And so, like in most MRI experiments, it seems like people want to have a, a block of trials during which the scanner is operating. And then once that scan ends, you want to have a break. And that break, often a good way to kind of implement that break is to do it and also add a little bit of like uh, nice eye tracker functionality is to do a drift check or drift correction between the blocks or the scan cycles. Um, and in an MRI environment, we don't really want to have a drift uh, correct or drift check between trials because like like we mentioned, the drift check or drift correct procedure waits for the participant or the experimenter to press a key and that adds kind of like a variable timing to things and as I mentioned, we in an MRI environment we kind of want the MRI to control the timing of things and if we're throwing drift checks into that scan block then we're kind of adding some unpredictability um, or we're losing the kind of control over the timing. And so in an MRI setting, we typically, if we're going to do a drift check, we'll, we'll do it between blocks. Um, and the way it works in an MRI setting is on, on, I mean, there are different ways you could do it. You could, you could, you're always like receiving the pulse or the signal from the MRI. Um, and some, some people want to just receive the pulse at the very beginning of the experiment and just have one pulse and then they do like one scan cycle and just do all the trials and use that one marker to kind of synchronize things. Some people just do one pulse at the beginning of each block. I'm going to show kind of a way to do a synchronization where you have one pulse for each trial just because that's kind of the most detailed way to do it and you can always kind of like generalize to use fewer pulses if you want, but I'm kind of doing the most rigorous synchronization method in this example. So in this example, we're going to do a different, like, we're going to have each trial start with a pulse from the from the MRI. Okay, and so in the example I just made, um, the trials are going to happen every eight seconds, and so in, in an MRI environment, um, people can, people often talk about this thing called a TR, which is like, the, the scanner is going to send a pulse at every TR and so often this, this TR has an interval of like two seconds meaning that the scanner once it starts scanning is going to send a pulse every two seconds. Um, in all the scanners I've seen that the, the duration of the TR is um, configurable so it doesn't have to be two seconds but since that's the most common TR I've seen um, this example is set up to assume a, a, a TR interval of two seconds. So in other words, once the scanner starts, it's going to send a pulse every two seconds. And in this example, the image is going to stay on the, like the total trial um, duration is kind of eight seconds. And so in each trial, the image stays on the screen for five seconds, and then the pulse, um, each fourth pulse from the MRI is going to signal the start of a new trial. So since we have a TR interval of two seconds and we want a total trial duration of eight seconds, um, every fourth TR signal is going to start the trial. Okay, so, oops, <laughs> I didn't mean to show the thank you thing yet. So let's, let's skip out of this um, and let's go to the MRI example. So let me jump up to the top level of this and you can see it looks a lot like the EEG example at the beginning, it just like basically sends some instructions and then presents some instructions and then goes into camera setup mode. A difference here is that we're then gonna oops, we're gonna let me get back up. We're then gonna go into a block sequence. And you can see I have the blocks block sequence set to have an iteration count of three, meaning that we're gonna do three different blocks. And at the beginning of each block, we're gonna do a drift check. So this is when the scanner is not running. We're going to do a drift check and make sure that the calibration accuracy is still good and recalibrate if needed. And then once things look good and the subject's fixing the target, the experimenter or subject can press a key and basically start the experimenter, 
I mean the experiment builder um, trial loop. And so you start that up and your experiment builder project is then going to start this loop of trials which is it's very similar to all our other experiment builder examples. Um, and sorry, let me point out that in the trial sequence each time this trial sequence is encountered, because the split by is set to four, it's only going to do four iterations. And so basically we've divided our total 12 iterations into three blocks of four trials each because our split by is set to four. So each time we do a new block iteration, when it gets to that trial sequence and it starts iterating, it's only going to do four iterations because the split by is set to four. So we're going to do four trials in that block. And again, like if you're not familiar with this type of thing, then you can go back and, and um, watch this uh, experiment builder tutorial video series. Um, but basically, we're going to do four of these on each trial, on each block. And on the first trial on each block, um, we want to basically just start waiting for a sync pulse from the scanner. Okay, so let's take a look at what's happening here. There's, there's some things that we need to talk about. Um, what we want to do is like on the first trial of each block, we want to um, sorry, let, me, let me just fix something real fast. On the first trial of each block, we want to not wait any amount. We want to just start not wait for a certain set amount. We want to just start waiting for a pulse from the scanner. And so in this example, I'm using a TTL input trigger. So this is different than the TTL action that we used in the EEG example. This is a TTL trigger and it has a circular shape and the arrow is going to the left. That means we're waiting for a TTL to come from the scanner. And if, you were use, if your scanner sends the signal as a keyboard press, this is where you would replace this with a keyboard trigger. But the idea is we are going to just wait for some change in the parallel port of the display PC's uh, status register. And the way, the way we can most easily wait for some kind of change in signal is to put the TTL trigger to, to pin mode. So like the um, like the TTL action, we can set the mode to pin, and then if we set each of these pins to either, then that means that this is going to fire whenever any pulse from the scanner is detected. And usually in scanning environments, the scanner is not like sending different pulse values for different trial types or anything. It is just sending the same pulse over and over again, and the pulse will just last for some brief amount of time. And if you have these set to either, then it will just fire when it detects that pulse. So this is the simplest way to set up the pulse detection if the pulse comes in over the par parallel port. Okay, so um, the so on the first trial, we want to just go straight to this. So let me show you how that works. Basically, I've added a variable here that's called trial within block. So this is going to code like which trial is this within our given scan block? Is it trial one, trial two, trial three, trial three, or trial four? And at the beginning of each scan block, I want to reset the value of this. Okay. And so what I'm doing is at the beginning of the block sequence, before we do our drift check, I have this reset trial within block. And I actually want to I realize I had a mistake here. I want to reset that to zero. So on the so using an update attribute action, I can click on its attribute value list to see what it's doing. I'm resetting that variable trial within block. I'm resetting its value property to zero. Okay. And then at the beginning of each trial, now I'm back in the recording sequence, I'm adding one to that value. So every time we do a new trial, we're adding one to it. So on the first trial, this trial within block is going to have a value one. On the second trial within the block, it's going to have a value two, etc. And each time we do a new, a new block, we're resetting it back, okay, through this reset trial within block. Okay, after we um, update the value of that variable, we're going to check, we're going to use a conditional trigger, this one here, to check to see if this is the first trial within the block. 
Okay, if it's the first trial within the block, then we just have to wait for the scan pulse to signal the start of the scan cycle from the MRI. Um, and when we receive that scan pulse, we're going to draw the trial's uh, stimulus. Okay? And that's what we're doing here. So let's just consider on the first trial, since it's the first, since it's the first trial, we're going to go down here and just start waiting for the for the for the sync pulse from the scanner. When we receive the sync pulse, draw the trial's events. And then here's where we do a little bit of trickery to make sure that we have an exact duration of eight seconds for every iteration of this loop. So in other words, we have exact duration of eight seconds from the onset of one trial stimulus to the onset of the next trial stimulus. So I'm not talking about just inner trial interval. I'm not talking about, in other words, the time from when the screen is blanked on each trial to the start of the next trial stimulus. I'm talking about the entire duration from the presentation one trial stimulus to the presentation of the next trial stimulus. We're trying to control to be eight seconds so that each trial basically happens on the onset of the fourth TR signal from the scanner. Okay, so this is a way that we can basically have each trial's onset be driven by a, a given TR sync signal from the scanner. So what I'm doing here is displaying the trial's events, <coughs> the trial stimulus, I, I, mean, I should say, and then using one of these update attribute actions to set the value of a variable that's called last trial time. Okay, so what I'm doing is having a variable here that's called last trial time that's going to mark the time when a given trial stimulus onsets. And so as soon as it onsets, you can see this update attribute action is setting the value of last trial time to be equal to the time of display trial stimulus. So that's this one. So we're recording into this variable the time when the trial stimulus onsets. And this is going to be used on the next trial to control the duration. So we, so we do that and then we present this stimulus for five seconds and then blank that trial. And actually just to be totally safe, I'm going to, for the start time in this, I'm going to link the start time to the time of the of the trial stimulus. So I'm going to make a reference to the display trial stimulus time here. That's a good practice. Anytime you have uh, any kind of nodes that are intervening between um, a display screen and a timer, you want to probably just make sure that the timer start time refers to the time of that event so that it's five seconds from the time of this and not any time that's added by intervening nodes. In this case, I don't think it would have mattered because this happened so fast. I mean, we're talking like way sub millisecond that it probably wouldn't matter, but just to be totally safe, I'm making the start time of this timer trigger reference the time of the trial's uh, image onset. Okay, so we wait five seconds there, and then we blank the screen. Okay, then this next trial's loop is going to happen. And this is where I want to mention that this, so basically this overall trial sequence, I'm inside the trial sequence right now, this trial sequence is the one that's doing the looping. It's the one that has the data source and it's the one that's looping. The recording sequence, as it should, only has an iteration count of one, meaning it's not really the thing that's, that's cycling. I mean, we are doing this recording sequence on each trial, but it's the overall trial sequence that's looping. And at the beginning of each trial sequence, we have a prepare sequence action. And the prepare sequence action takes some time to execute. So this is this takes about 500 milliseconds if we are transferring the trial's image to the host PC or about 300 milliseconds if we're not transferring to the host PC. Um, and in most cases we are transferring to the host PC. And so this is taking about 500 milliseconds. We, you know, we don't know the exact amount of time, but it's roughly 500 milliseconds. And so we want to make sure that the next trial um, starts at a certain TR amount. And so what I'm doing here is just like doing a little bit of extra control to make sure that we're kind of incorporating that prepare sequence duration into the duration of a kind of inner trial interval timer and making sure that we're going to miss the pulse for TR for the third TR um, which is going to happen at six seconds because remember I'm, I'm saying that we want 
the trials events to happen on the fourth TR for whatever reason. I'm just trying to illustrate that we can make it locked to a particular TR. Um, and so what I'm doing here is like, since I want the, the trials events to happen on the fourth TR and not the TR that happens at six seconds, what we're going to do here is at, on each trial, when a trials event happens, we're going to set the last trial time here, and then we're going to go around, loop around the next trial, do the prepare sequence, enter back into the recording sequence, and then um, add to the trial counter. So now this is going to be trial number two. And this is going to check if it's trial number one. And since it's trial number two, we're going to go down here and hit this inner trial interval timer. And this is kind of helping us make sure that we miss the, the third TR. So what we're doing here is we have the desired wait time. So I just kind of added a little variable here to store desired wait time. And I set that to 7,500. I didn't set it to 8,000 because I don't, like, we want to have eight seconds in between trials. But we don't want um, to miss the pulse that comes at, at, um, at time 8,000. And so I set, I set this timer's duration, which is actually just a reference to this desired wait time. I set it to 7,500 so that the last 500 milliseconds is spent just waiting for the TR, which is going to be exactly at 8 seconds, right? And so we want the control of the timing to be um, done by the MRI. And so I'm just waiting enough so that we we kind of get almost to the TR to the next TR signal, but not quite. So that the remaining time is just waiting for the TR signal from the from the MRI. And so what we're doing is on any trial that's greater than one in the block, we're going to wait 7,500 milliseconds from the time of the last trial, and then we're going to hit this action null action, and then wait that remaining 500 milliseconds. Um, with this TTL trigger. And then that pulse will come from the scanner at 8 seconds and that will drive the, the stimulus for the next trial. Okay, so it's, you, can, you can see there's like a little bit of extra like kind of timing work to do here. Um, but it's really, it's not that complicated. So let, let's just reiterate one more time. On the first trial, we're just going to skip this timer altogether and start waiting for the first pulse of, from the scanner. Okay, so we're going to get on here and just start waiting for that first pulse. Then we're going to draw the trial's stimulus. Then we're going to set this variable, last trial time, to be equal to the time when that last stimulus was drawn. Then we're going to make sure our trial stimulus stays up for five seconds and blank the screen. And then once the screen's blank, there's nothing else in this recording sequence, so we're going to go out and prepare the next trial and then enter back into this recording sequence and then add to our trial counter, which is now going to be two, and then since it's two, we're going to go to the left side of our um, conditional trigger here. And this thing, this timer trigger, is going to wait 7,500 milliseconds from the time of the last trial stimulus. And so that'll put us here at the time of the last trial stimulus plus 7,500 and th so that we miss the, the six-second TR. And then this one will wait the additional 500 milliseconds so that we draw the next trial stimulus at TR number four or at the eight second TR. Okay, so that's how you can do the MRI synchronization. Let me save this. Um, and so that, that's a, the general kind of um, ideas behind EEG and MRI synchronization. Um, the only difference for the MRI is if, you, if it's coming in a keyboard trigger, you would replace that with a, a keyboard trigger right there instead of a TTL trigger. Um, so does anybody, if anybody has any questions, I'll be happy to go through this. I know some of this stuff is complicated, so don't be afraid. Um, but if there aren't any other questions, then we can uh, just go back to my slide and see my little thank you message. Okay, anyways, thanks a lot for attending the webinar, and um, I'll post a recording of this after we're done with it, and I'll post these experiment builder examples in the PowerPoint so that you can use these things as reference. And if you ever have any questions about any of these procedures,
then don't hesitate to send an email to us um, at support at sr-research.com or by posting to the forums. Um, so thanks again and uh, good luck with all your programming.